So tonight we are going to be talking about uh, a few of these, well, all of these topics listed on the screen. And just a little disclaimer. So this information is not intended to replace the information given to you by your primary healthcare provider or GI specialist. They are the experts in your care and each patient with IBD should be treated on an individual basis. We're gonna just briefly go over the gastrointestinal system. And this is also called the digestive system, or sometimes people might refer to it as the GI system. So we take in food through our mouths, it gets transported to our stomachs by our esophagus. And when the food is in our stomach, it starts to break down. Um, the acids in the stomach start to break down the foods that we eat. Then food travels to the small intestine, and it's not so small, it's about 15 feet long, and its job is to absorb nutrients from the foods that we eat. So when inflammatory bowel disease is active in this area, so being that the tissues uh, of the intestine and the small intestine are inflamed and damaged, nutritional deficiencies can occur because that's where um, the food gets absorbed, the nutrients get absorbed. Then the food moves to the large intestine, and the large intestine is three to four feet long, and its job is to absorb water. So if disease, uh, if um, ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease is active in this area, there's less op opportunity for our bodies to absorb that water. And this can contribute to those watery stools that some, some individuals experience. Very briefly, we're just gonna talk about the differences between um, the two main types of inflammatory bowel disease. So IBD or inflammatory bowel disease is an umbrella term for two diseases uh, which cause inflammation of the bowel. So inflammation, there's redness, there's swelling, there's ulcers or sores within the um, GI tract. And that inflammation is the common denominator between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. With Crohn's disease, it can affect anywhere in the GI tract from gum to bum or from mouth to anus. And, it, and the disease goes through all layers of the bowel wall. So all tissues within that system are affected. With ulcerative colitis, oh, sorry, just wanna back up. With Crohn's disease, you can have areas of healthy tissue and diseased tissue next to each other. So you might have an area of healthy tissue, then diseased tissue, then healthy tissue. So it's very patchy. Uh, there are differences with ulcerative colitis. So ulcerative colitis, uh, that disease portion actually starts from the anus and the rectum, so, so from the bottom, and continuously works its way up through the intestinal, the large intestine. So the disease is only in the large intestine, rectum and anus, and it's only the innermost bowel layers that are effective. So that, that is with ulcerative colitis. So there are some slight differences with Crohn's uh, and ulcerative colitis. In terms of statistics, Canada has one of the highest rates of IBD in the world with over 270,000 Canadians experiencing IBD. And, and you can see the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis numbers are broken down there for you. Um, and it's estimated by 2030 that that number, that 270,000, is going to increase to over 400,000 Canadians with IBD. So that's just in a few short years. The older adult age group is one of the fastest growing groups of individuals who have IBD. And so um, that's why we're here tonight, because we want to provide you with some more information. So this rate of increasing disease in older adults um, is both due to new diagnoses after the age of 60 or 65, just depending on which resource you're looking at. So new diagnoses after the age of 60 and 65 and older, and also previously diagnosed individuals who've had I, who have IBD who are moving into this aging or this older adult um, category. So there, there's essentially two groups, um, newly diagnosed groups in older adulthood and those that already have the disease and are moving into older adulthood with the disease. And just looking, just uh, another tidbit of information here for you, of those individuals who are newly diagnosed in older adulthood, 90% of those cases 
get diagnosed when in the age ranges between 60 and 70 years of age. So, sorry, 60 and 79 years of age. So the majority of the newly diagnosed cases are between the ages of 60 to six, sorry, 60 to 79 years. Now that's, you can have new diagnoses of IBD older than 79 years, but the majority of the cases will be uh, in the 60th and 70th decade. Now, it's challenging uh, for those of you that are newly diagnosed in older adulthood. Um, the, the diagnosis can be particularly challenging due to some coexisting conditions that can exist. And there also can be potential misdiagnoses related to similar symptoms of other GI conditions. So conditions such as diverticular disease, um, ischemic bowel disease, and infectious colitis all show very similar symptoms. And so sometimes um, individuals who have IBD in older adulthood who are newly diagnosed, they might be misdiagnosed with something else to begin with. So diagnosis can be quite challenging. And so I'm not sure if some of you may have experienced that. What causes IBD? Well, the short answer is the cause is not clear. We, are, we don't know. Um, but we know it's a combination of these four factors. And if you're really interested in further detail related to this um, slide, do, um, Sarah will, will probably allude to it at the end of the, the um, session tonight, but there are newly diagnosed videos that will be coming online um, quite shortly. And um, I do go into it in a bit more detail, but for, there are some individuals because of their genetic makeup are more likely to develop IBD than others. And these individuals are exposed to something in the environment, not sure what it is yet. Uh, and these, um, this exposure can alter our gut microbiome. And what is our microbiome? It is a community of healthy microorganisms that live in our and multiply in our gut, a digestive system or our gut that maintain our digestive health. Health. So that exposure to something in the environment alters our gut microbiome and it causes this abnormal immune response where our body starts to attack its its own tissues in the digestive system. All right, so intermixed with being diagnosed with IBD, there's also the complexities of aging in general. So as we get older, every single body system starts declining. So our heart, our lungs, our kidneys, our liver, and our GI tract, all of our body systems, they start to decline. And older adults are much more likely to have other disease conditions or comorbidities than younger individuals. So heart disease, um, cancer, just by, just by virtue of being older, you might, you know, you, the older adults certainly have an increased risk of having other conditions as well on top of IBD. Uh, our immune systems don't work as well when we are older, so um, the risk of infection is greater in older adults as well. I'm going to talk about some of the other risks. For example, um, our risk of cancer increases when we get older, and then um, those of us that have IBD, as we get older, our, our risk of colorectal cancer will increase. And so I, I'm going to talk about some of those conditions um, at the end of the presentation as well. In terms of our liver and our kidneys, the medications that we are on, any medications, uh, are the drugs are processed by the liver to be used by the body and excreted or removed by the kidneys. So if we have decreased liver function uh, or decreased kidney function, uh, our drugs may not be processed and um, the, the waste products of those drugs may not be excreted or, or removed from our bodies as well. So there's lots of complicated factors um, just due to the aging process. Ulcerative colitis is more common in older adults than Crohn's disease. Uh, when um, individuals are diagnosed in older adulthood, the symptoms of the disease might be more subtle. 
So um, you might have just a small amount of abdominal pain or cramping. Um, you might not have any rectal bleeding. Um, so some of the kind of the key symptoms that we would expect for somebody who has IBD, they might be less noticeable in somebody who is an older adult. In general, the disease of IBD is, can be less severe for those that are older adults. And so um, I guess that's, that's definitely good news because you have less severe disease. Um, it could be less frequent flares. So when your disease is active, uh, milder symptoms, uh, less or shorter periods of active disease, um, less intestinal involvement. So um, there are, I guess, positives about having IBD in older adulthood. Uh, and generally, for those that are newly diagnosed, the um, disease is co most commonly found in the large intestine. So um, even for Crohn's disease, because if you remember earlier in the presentation, I said that Crohn's disease is only in or can occur anywhere in the GI tract. Uh, a lot of the times in younger uh, individuals, that they'll, the disease of Crohn's disease will be in the small intestine. But in older adults, we see that both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are more frequently seen in the large intestine. In terms of managing IBD, uh, we need to be clear that there's no cure for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and the management of IBD is very individualized. So IBD can be controlled using um, medications, maybe altering diet, and in some instances, surgery to help um, you live a quality life. Generally, life expectancy is not shortened as a result of IBD. However, as older adults, you may have other health conditions that may shorten your life expectancy. The goal of management um, therapies are to help reduce the inflammation that's in the intestinal system and manage the symptoms that you might be experiencing. So management can include a combination of all these factors. Just to make note, some people can have a long periods of remission where the disease is inactive and that inflammation in the um, GI system is gone. So where periods of time where they are free of these symptoms. And, but the disease course is, can be quite unpredictable. So one of the questions was, um, you know, kind of what to expect. It's very hard to predict. So, and that um, can be quite frustrating for some individuals because you might be well one day and not well the next day. Uh, so it can be quite frustrating, as with any chronic condition. The goal of care remains consistent uh, between younger adults and older adults uh, uh, with these kind of management options. Okay, so we'll just go, we're gonna dive right in and talk about each of those. And the first one being drug therapy. So the goal of drug therapy is to reduce and control that inflammation within the digestive system, induce and maintain that remission. So, um, making the disease quiet in essence and improving the quality of life. Um, it's, it's important because this is where it can get a quite complex. Uh, if you have other comorbid conditions, so other conditions, chronic conditions, other diseases, um, you might be on other medications for those diseases as well. So then when we talk about bring, adding in new medications for your IBD, there might be drug interactions between some of those medications. Uh, and so it, there's greater risk of, of interactions, there's greater risk of side effects. Uh, and so medication management options need to be carefully considered uh, with older adults. Uh, it's important to use one pharmacy for all of your prescriptions so that the pharmacist can assess the effect that each medication medication has on the other. And if you are taking quite a few um, pills every day or in potentially injections, um, the you know you're at greater risk for if you're taking multiple for to forgetting to take them 
and simply not taking them, maybe due to costs or side effects. Uh, so what's helpful is prepackaged medication packs that you can get from the pharmacy. Very, very helpful to help cue you to remember to take your medications at certain times. So that's another suggestion that I, I would recommend. There are uh, risks and benefits for each and every medication that you take. So you'll need to discuss those options with your pharmacist, with your healthcare provider to really weigh them out. The medications that we, are, that we can give for patients um, in, with IBD are in two broad categories. So the ones I'm gonna be talking about tonight are those that reduce that inflammation. But there's also medications that are aimed at symptom reduction. So if you're having lots of diarrhea, you know, you might take something to help slow that, <clears throat> slow your diarrhea down. And so there are other resources available. What's important to remember that each person is different. So two patients might have Crohn's disease, but they'll be on completely different medications. So, <coughs> pardon me. So don't be alarmed if you're talking to somebody else and, and they, um, <coughs> pardon me, I'm just gonna take a moment and take a drink. Okay, thanks for bearing with me there. Um, so each person is different. So there's no one size fits all. The first drug class we're going to talk about, oh, and I should say, uh, I should preface this by saying that I'm, I'm definitely not a pharmacist. So if you have specific medication questions, I may not be able to answer them. Uh, but certainly your pharmacist is really the expert or potentially your healthcare provider as well. But I'll do my best. So aminosalicylates, some examples of the, these medications are sulfasalazine, mesalalamine. The um, trade names for these medications are Pentasa, Asacol, Mesavant, Salofelc. So these medications are generally very safe for older adults to use. You will see them um, being used in mild to moderate IBD. And they're one of the most commonly used medications for patients um, who are in the older adult age group. They can be used in combination with other medications from other drug classes. And depending on where your disease is, where in the GI system, they can be taken by mouth or rectally. There's, this is a very low risk medication, as I mentioned, and does not increase your risk of infection. Some of the other medications from the other drug classes will increase your risk of developing other infections. So um, this is a relatively safe medication. And so um, you might find that your healthcare provider starts you on this, this class of medications. Another type of medication class are the steroids or the glucocorticoids. So examples will be prednisone, hydrocortisone, uh, they are used to decrease that inflammation quite quickly. And they are better if you use them only for short periods of time because they have quite a few side effects. And, um, and in particular for older adults, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. We can use them in combination with other medications from other drug classes, and they can be taken by mouth or injection. So some of the risks are they increase your risk of infection. So, um, you know, things like colds and flus, you, your, your immune system is gonna be quite depleted by taking these medications. So you're, you may need, to, or you might be at more risk for developing those types of infections or even pneumonia. Um, use long-term, you can get acne, facial swelling, osteoporosis, which we're gonna talk about specifically later on. Um, glaucoma, high blood pressure, cataracts, so lots of um, side effects with this particular medication. So osteoporosis, uh, uh, yes, as I mentioned, osteoporosis we're going to talk about later on. If you are diabetic or if you have high blood pressure, this may not be an ideal medication for you 
because it can in, um, alter your blood sugar levels and it can um, um, alter your, your blood pressure as well. So that would just need to be monitored more closely if you were on those and had those pre-existing conditions. These medications, these steroids need to be tapered. Um, so you, you don't want, if you are on them, you don't wanna stop taking them suddenly. Uh, your body could experience withdrawal symptoms. So steroids are similar to cortisol, which is a hormone naturally made by your adrenal glands. And if taken for more than a few weeks, those adrenal glands in your body slow their own cortisol production. So you're, they kind of get lazy. And so if you stop taking steroids quite quickly, your adrenal glands can't start producing their own cortisol right away. And so you might experience some side, some side effects. So really important to um, taper as directed by your healthcare provider or pharmacist. Immunomodulators. Some examples of these are 6-MP azathioprine methotrexate. Uh, they are used for moderate to severe IBD and can be used in combination with other medications. They are taken by mouth or injection. Now, <clears throat> uh, for older adults, they generally do not recommend azathioprine or imuran is the um, trade name for it because it can increase your risk of developing lymphoma or cancer of the white blood cells. And it's particularly for the older adult age group. So generally you, you probably won't um, see that medication or may not see that medication being used in older adults. Uh, these uh, immunomodulators alter your immune system. So you are at an increased risk of developing infections more so than the general population. Um, they can be quite taxing on your liver, so you might see um, your liver enzymes, so that's related to, they can assess that through your blood work, so the stress on your liver, um, you might see those being elevated slightly, and there is an increased risk of cancer, as I mentioned, uh, lymphoma, although it is um, small, it is still higher than younger adult population. The final drug class we're going to talk about are the biologics and biosimilars. So these are the um, Remicade or Inflectra, Humira, Simsia, Samponi, and Tivio. They are used for moderate to severe IBD and again can be used in combination with other medications. They're taken by injection or intravenously just depending on the medication. And with these as well, there is that increased risk of infection and a low risk of cancer. There are, um, what, there is one medication that is safer than others, um, and that is the Entivio. So the, the research is showing that that is more, um, yeah, it might be a safer choice than say the Remicade or the Humira. Um, the, the Remicade, the Humira types of medications, they're called anti-TNF agents and they have been shown to increase infection rates quite significantly. Um, and um, so it's, you might be seeing those less or you know the option, the first option, if you do need to take a biologic would be the Intivio potentially. There is a new oral medication that I just wanted to mention. It's called Zelgance, it's for um, ulcerative colitis, and it is a pill. It has similar um, side effects, so the increased risk of infection, increased um, cancer risk, but um, it is an option, and it's it's an, a pill form, which is nicer than an injection or an intravenous um, uh, intravenous medication. With these medications, the your healthcare provider will want to do regular blood work to monitor your immune system, your liver, your kidney functioning. So use those, um, uh, do get your blood work taken regularly. If you are on those medications, don't forget, put it in your calendar. Some of these medications can be quite costly. Um, so you, uh, your provincial health plan may cover a portion, you might have private insurance that may cover a portion, um, or even some drug companies will help to pay for some uh, of the costs. So, the, but the cost is a factor with these, these medications. If you have heart failure, uh, congestive heart failure, 
the Remicade and the Humira are not recommended uh, because they can make it significantly worse. I just want to talk a bit about vaccinations. Um, it is that time of year. It's flu shot time. Um, in particular, the immunomodulators, the steroids, and the biologics decrease your risk, or sorry, increase your risk of infection and getting sick from others. And so it's important um, if you have chronic health conditions, such as inflammatory bowel disease, that you consider um, getting vaccinated. And the non-live vaccines or the dead vaccines are safe for administration. So for example, the flu vaccine, it's a yearly vaccine that is recommended um, for individuals who are on these medications as well as seniors. Um, the pneumococcal vaccine, so that prevents pneumonia. Um, it's, it's a severe lung infection that is recommended. And if you have had chicken pox, you are at risk for shingles. And um, shingles is this painful rash that can occur on one side of your body and um, you, there is a vaccine. Um, it is a non-live vaccine called Shingrix, and it is um, uh, can can be considered as well. So it's it's available to individuals over 50. <clears throat> so moving on to diet, this is one of the most common questions I get: is oh, what type of diet should I be on? And <laughs> there is no special recommended diet that works for everyone. I know it would be great if we had like one answer, one recommended diet, but unfortunately we don't. Uh, there are no foods that cause inflammatory bowel disease, and diet is not effective in treating inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so if you are feeling well, your disease is inactive or in remission, you can pretty much eat whatever you would like. Um, certainly a well-balanced diet is recommended. You may want to avoid trigger foods. What are trigger foods? Trigger foods are in individual foods, sorry, foods that are individual to you that make your symptoms worse. So you might have increased abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, gas. These are um, symptoms and some examples of Common trigger foods are things like alcohol, caffeine, spicy foods, greasy foods, sugars, and dairy products. So a lot of patients with IBD are lactose intolerant because they get these symptoms. So they may avoid dairy, or you might feel unwell if you um, take in dairy, cow's milk. And so um, these would be examples of trigger foods. So you might choose to specifically eliminate certain foods from your diet, but it, you certainly don't need to if you have IBD. There are some dietary supplements um, that are um, recommended, particularly if your disease is active, you might not be eating as much as you normally would be, um, you, you might not have an appetite, you might be quite dehydrated, you might um, not be taking in as, as much food as you normally would, and so, you know, a multivitamin is recommended, in particular those that are, um, well, I'm gonna talk about calcium and vitamin D very specifically in osteoporosis, but supplementation for calcium and vitamin D are recommended for st strength, you know, strengthening the bones. Uh, vitamin B12 is another uh, potential vitamin that you might need, it helps to form red blood cells. And um, so even if you're um, losing some blood, this might, vitamin B12 might be useful. Probiotics, probiotics promote that good bacteria in your gut. So they promote that growth of that healthy microbiome. Uh, and in individuals with ulcerative colitis, probiotics have been shown to decrease inflammation uh, in some individuals. Uh, so, you might find that that is helpful. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are do have some anti-inflammatory effects. They are um, things like cold water fish, so salmon, tuna, um, those sorts of things. Even fish oils have an element of, um, of that anti-inflammatory property. Now, what if 
you are having a flare up. So this is where you, there's an active inflammation within the digestive system. You're experiencing those symptoms and um, your disease is, is active. You can avoid those trigger foods. And how do you know which foods are your trigger foods? You can keep um, a diary or a notebook that's, you know, describes what you've eaten and how you feel a couple of hours after, and that will help you to determine which are your trigger foods. You can eat safe foods. What are safe foods? These are bland foods that do not bother your digestive system. They're easy to digest. White rice, white bread, bananas, applesauce, turkey, chicken, fish. So those are generally safe and easy to digest. Eating smaller meals more frequently, and you may not have a big appetite to begin with. And so um, it's easier to digest if you have smaller meals, even if it's you know something every hour, something every couple of hours, that's certainly easier to digest than you know a big turkey dinner. <clears throat> uh, stool thickening foods. If you find that you are having um, quite a bit of diarrhea, there are foods that will bulk up your stool, such as cheese, peanut butter, pretzels, or chips. They do recommend it to include a protein with each meal or snack, and those are examples there. And that those will help, um, you know, in, keep your muscles strong, help with wound healing. So protein is is uh, in moderation is a good thing. Keep hydrated. Um, you know, you might not normally be the type of person, especially as an older adult, you don't feel thirsty um, a lot of the time. So just be mindful, keep drinking water on a regular basis, uh, limit alcohol and caffeine intake because that can, and even tea, that can really dehydrate you. And if you're having several loose watery stools, it doesn't take much um, for you to become dehydrated. So just be mindful of drinking water on a regular basis. Um, they, they do recommend up to two liters a day. So that can be quite, um, quite large to uh, quite a large amount to take in. If you are having trouble eating solid food, you might want to consider high calorie liquid formulas, things like Boost, Ensure, um, anything. You can get them um, pretty much anywhere nowadays. I do recommend them cold uh, or you know you can mix them with ice in a blender to make a bit of a smoothie, um, but they're much more tasty when they're they're cold as opposed to warm. In most older adult, older adult patients with IBD, surgery occurs when the medication therapy doesn't work to obtain that remission or the or there are complications. And um, there are mixed reports of surgical rates, so I can't give you exact numbers because there's conflicting evidence on the numbers of surgeries, but um, just some stats, I guess. So hospitalization rates within the first year of diagnosis were at the same level or higher than younger counterparts, but they do decrease over time. Um, and care by GI specialists reduces surgical rates. So if you are being managed by a, um, a general practitioner, family practitioner, um, you, the statistics show that you might have increased um, surgery rates. Um, but again, that's just uh, in general, generally speaking. Because uh, as older adults, all of our systems are not functioning as well as they once were, um, older adults do have higher complication rates. And that's because their heart and their lungs are not as strong as they used to be and or are you know, the, the liver can't process all of those um, anesthetic with the surgery. Uh, and um, older adult individuals may have other chronic health conditions that just make it that much more complex. So um, individuals, older adults can have higher complication rates. Other options, so things just to keep in the back of your mind, if you do need surgery, 
don't be afraid to ask for home care services or occupational or occupational or physical therapies. So you might need things such as a raised toilet seat so you don't have to bend down so far, grab bars in the shower, um, so occupational therapists can help with that. You might need um, physical therapy to assist with your mobility or your movement walking after surgery. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask for that. You might have um, a, a wound that you might need staff, nursing staff, to come in and change that dressing because you're just not able to do that yourself. Or you might need somebody to assist with you with washes. So um, your personal, you know, daily care. So um, helping with washes or meals. There are services out there that can help you after surgery or even if you are just feeling unwell and your disease is quite active. So don't be afraid that, you know, to, to seek out those services if you need to. Not everyone who has surgery will require an ostomy, but I just wanted to um, put a little bit of information into this presentation um, about ostomies. Um, ostomy, um, they will remove a part of the intestine and bring that part of the intestine um, that's remaining to the surface of the, the abdomen. So stool is released through an opening on the abdomen called a stoma and its stool is collected in a device called an appliance. And so there are specialized nurses who can help with um, learning about your ostomy and there are lots of support groups across uh, Canada. So Ostomy Canada and there are other resources um, in other countries as well. But. There are other um, conditions that can occur outside of the intestines that are common or more common in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease. And these conditions, they're listed, some of them are listed there. They are, can be related to active inflammation in your intestine or not. So some patients may have arthritis, for example, and um, they, that's an inflammatory condition um, but, you know, their arthritis, they might find, oh, you know, my knees or my hands are very swollen today, but my gut is feeling okay. So it doesn't, it's, it's not directly related to how your um, IBD is feeling, but they, these diseases are linked to, or they're more common with individuals who have IBD. So you can have inflammation of your eyes. You can have inflammation in your joints, so arthritis. You can have inflammation of your spine and pelvis, ankylosing spondylitis. <clears throat> there, you can have inflammation of the bile ducts in and around your liver, so primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, this is a very rare condition, um, but the bile ducts become inflamed, narrowed, hard, and it can eventually cause damage to your liver. So liver cirrhosis and liver failure. And actually, primary sclerosing cholangitis, it is very rare in IBD, but you can develop um, cancer related to that. So bile duct cancer, gallbladder cancer, liver cancer, and colorectal cancer. We're gonna talk about colorectal cancer at the end. Um, and skin conditions as well, inflammatory skin conditions, psoriasis. Pyoderma gangrenosum. So it's this inflammation is not limited to the intestines. It can be elsewhere in the body as well. There are other conditions, and I'm going to go into each one of these um, very specifically in the next few minutes. But age is a risk factor for these other conditions, but so is IBD. IBD if you have IBD, it increases your risk for developing these conditions. Also, age is also um, a risk factor and further complicates things. Okay, and I, I do apologize. I don't usually like to have a lot of information on the slide, but I think it's important and it's easier to refer to. So, um, uh, so here it is, I guess. Uh, so osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is a condition that causes your bones to become thin 
and porous or weak. Um, so they become weaker and you're at increased risk for uh, fractures or increased risk for your bones breaking. So these risk factors are age, as I mentioned, long-term steroid therapy, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, if you are a woman, you are more at risk. So all of these factors place you at higher risk for developing osteoporosis. How do you reduce the risk, especially if you are an older adult? Um, they recommend a daily calcium supplement of 1200 milligrams and a vitamin D supplement. And the, the range is quite broad there, but 800 to 2000 international units. And with osteoporosis, you cannot feel it. Uh, you usually have no symptoms until you break a bone. Uh, and so um, it's important to be proactive. So there are, um, you know, these supplement recommendations for individuals, older adults who have IBD and have uh, these other risk factors as well. There is another medication that I didn't put on there, but you may want to speak to your um, healthcare provider about. It's used to um, treat, I guess, osteoporosis if you do actually have it. It's called uh, um, biphosphonates, and or sorry, bisphosphonates. And it's uh, an example would be Fosamax. So this is um, a medication that can help build stronger bones. Another way to reduce the risk is to do weight-bearing exercises. So this is walking, these are weights. So if you are a swimmer, that's great for general healthy activity, but it, will, it is not a weight-bearing exercise. It's easy on the joints, right? But it's not going to help prevent osteoporosis. So you need something that's going to strengthen. So walking, running, aerobics, um, weights. They can be light weights, you know, two to three pounds of weights for your muscles, but they help keep that those bones strong. Um, how do we test for osteoporosis? It's a, a series of specialized x-rays called bone mineral density tests. So if you feel like you are at risk, um, you can ask your, your healthcare professional to test you for osteoporosis. All right, colorectal cancer. So, Damage to the intestine or rectum, such as with inflammatory bowel disease, can increase your likelihood of cancer to be developed. So can colorectal cancer is cancer of the large intestine or rectum. As we age, we are increased, uh, we have an increased likelihood of developing cancer. If we have IBD, that also increases our likelihood. And specifically those of us that have had IBD for more than 10 years, uh, for those of us that have had ulcerative colitis, because it is limit ulcerative colitis, the damage is in the large intestine. Um, other risk factors for cancer are having a family history of cancer and if you are male. Symptoms of colorectal cancer are very similar to IBD. Um, changing in frequency of bowel movements, alternate bout, bouts of diarrhea and constipation, uh, feelings of abdominal bloating, cramps, weight loss, fatigue, so it can be quite, quite similar, um, blood in stool. So the key here is early detection. So um, what's recommended is a stool test for blood. And this is a home test um, where you uh, put a sample of your stool on a slide and mail it in, or um, there might be other ways in which you can do this, but um, basically they will analyze your, your stool for blood. And if it is positive for blood, they can also test you with a colonoscopy and taking tissue samples or biopsies with it. Um, colonoscopy, for those of you that don't know what that is, it is um, in, an investigation with a lighted instrument into the, to the large intestine, so up the rectum uh, into the large intestine and, and um, the small intestine. So it looks at your intestines from the inside with a camera and a light, and they can take tissue samples as well. 
How do you reduce your risk for developing colorectal cancer? Um, healthy diet, less red meat and processed foods, regular exercise, healthy weight, quit smoking, alcohol in moderation. So these are very general um, risk reduction um, suggestions. Okay, other types of cancers, as I mentioned, there's lymphoma, so that's cancer of the white blood cells, and uh, skin cancer as well, melanoma, are rare but are increased if you are on immunosuppressive medications such as Imuran. So just wanted to um, just highlight that as well. Okay, um, and cardiovascular disease, so blood vessel disease. This is a buildup of plaque in the arteries of the heart and brain. What are the risk factors here? Increasing age, inflammatory bowel disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, inactivity, increased cholesterol. Um, so there's quite a few risk factors. How do you reduce that risk? Well, it's very similar to um, the risk reduction factors I've mentioned earlier. You can see them um, listed there. What's important here is monitoring your blood pressure and your cholesterol levels quite regularly um, so, so you can keep track of those, those items. Venous thromboembolism. So it's like a mouthful there for you, but um, it, they are blood clots in your deep veins or your lungs. Uh, these can be quite um, quite severe. They can travel to your heart, to your lungs, and to your brain, and they could cause um, severe, um, um, oh goodness, <laughs> what is the word I'm looking for? Sorry about that. I'm having a little brain freeze there, but um, significant disability and even death. So quite serious. Risk factors, again, are a increasing age, inflammatory bowel disease. If you're hospitalized, you are more at risk. And if you are immobile, so if you are not walking uh, around as much as you normally would be for whatever reason, might be after surgery, might be because you're just feeling unwell, might be because of arthritis, um, you are at risk for blood clots. So how to reduce that risk? Physical activity uh, and anticoagulant medication if needed. Uh, so everyone, we're really good as healthcare providers to provide everyone who's in hospital anticoagulants because in hospital you're sick, you're not moving around as much as you normally would be. But it's the outside um, outpatients, uh, patients who are in the community who may be more at risk for developing these blood clots because you may not be on that anticoagulation therapy. So just um, if you have an increased risk of clots that you know about, um, certainly talk with your healthcare provider, but certainly those of us with IBD and have increasing age may be at an increased risk of developing blood clots. So it can be life-threatening. 